Hey, hey, it's Edna Keep here. Welcome to the Seven Figure Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Edna Keep with Seven Figure Real Estate. And today I have with me a, a fellow real estate entrepreneur and also mindset coach, Joe Evangelisti. And uh, Joe has some oh really interesting background, but instead of reading through his bio, I like to actually hear it from uh, his words firsthand because what I, what I find Joe is that a lot of, a lot of the bios like like we they're professionally done, so they cut off or cover, cover off some really good stuff. But lots of times things have changed in your life recently, and and there's new stuff that comes out. So um, give us a little bit of your background, kind of how you got where you uh, are where you are today to start with. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on the show, Ed, and I appreciate that. Um, I, uh, I, I I tell everybody that my whole my whole background is construction, right? I've been doing construction my whole life. My my dad was a general contractor growing up. Uh, actually, he was a drywall contractor turned general contractor growing up. And you know, as long as I, I can remember, even when I was a little boy, hanging onto his leg and like getting drug around project sites and you know, being afraid <laughs> I'm going to fall in a hole somewhere and hurt myself. Um, but I've been been in construction just my whole life. I love I loved it. It was always part of me, and it was always something I loved to do. And um, you know, all the way through high school, I worked for him, and uh, inevitably I ended up joining the the U.S. Navy Seabees, which most people never heard of, but they're actually the construction battalions. Um, of the Navy, and we get to fly around everywhere and build stuff and do oh, cool things. Yeah, and um, nice. you know, I did six years in the Navy in construction. Well, that that's so interesting. So your dad was a successful businessman and kind of got your give your start there. What transitioned you to owning real estate? Because I, I have a lot of people out there that have a, you know a, a strong uh, background in construction, and they they come to me and they kind of go, you know what? I wish I would have kept some of that stuff instead of building it for everybody else. Is that kind of what happened to you? Yeah, you kind of you kind of hit it on the head. My dad was actually first of all my inspiration, but he was really the first uh, in in my family to be an entrepreneur. Right, my, I, I'm actually third generation Italian. My grandparents came here off the boat. And, you know, everyone always had jobs, the whole family that had jobs, they worked a nine to five. My dad really was the first guy to break out, become an entrepreneur and go do his own thing. And so I always had that entrepreneurial bone in my back, you know, in, in my background, but, you know, joined the Navy kind of gave me that discipline and that organization and that leadership. And then when I finally got out, I decided, you know what, I, I know that I can build anything, right? I was confident in my construction abilities. I know I could build anything. And so I just had to figure out like, okay, what's the, what's the, the, the investment side look like? How do I get a mortgage? How do I partner up with somebody? How do I create, you know, a deal? And so uh, I, I very quickly started studying that, that stuff and, uh, you know, jumped into my first deal and I call it the unlucky deal because <laughs> unfortunately for me, um, I started in 2007, right? So, okay. um, you know, I thought I was going to jump in there, start flipping houses, make a ton of cash, um, you know, retire young. Uh, be happy, the whole thing. And what happened was we got into our first two, three deals. Um, and as you know, because I'm sure you were in the game back then, the market yeah. turned on us and crashed and imploded instantly. And um, that's where I learned I had to pivot. I had to shift. I had to you know, create different opportunity and, and, and figure out, hey, this thing isn't going the way I wanted to, but how can I make it do it the way I want it to? And we started making some changes and ended up being a landlord by default, right? I put tenants in there and refinanced and stabilized the properties, thank God. Um, but if it wasn't for that will to pivot, I think we could have got stuck really easy early on. Well, and, and that uh, brings me to this question. How do you create a pivot to unlock your true potential? Like something that uh, I, I know it's sometimes happens from something nasty that happens to you because that's where we get yeah. our biggest growth. But what, what do you, how do you teach people that, that about that pivot? Yeah, I love that. So I mean, I, I went through quite a few pivots before I really started to dial in and say, okay, I got to figure out how to make changes, right? I, it was about five or six years after I started where it was, I found myself as a landlord. I found myself as a real estate broker. I had a team. I had two little, two little girls. I had a wife, two dogs. And I found myself chasing a hundred different things at the same time, right? I think mm -hmm. a lot of people can relate to that. It's always the next deal or the next contract or the next conversation. And, you know, I felt like um, I was living success, what everyone's definition of it was. Like people were like patting me on the back, you're doing great, you know, money in, money out. But I never felt successful because I kept chasing. And what I was finding was that, you know, I would, I would 
you know, make excuses. I'm not going to be home for dinner. I got to work late. I'm busy and busy, you know, and busy, busy, busy uh, ended up me not seeing my wife, not seeing my kids grow up, not, not missing family barbecues and things like that. And I had, I had a, a slight almost breakdown at, at that point and said, okay, something's got to give. I can't be everything to everyone. And that was my second big pivot. And at that point, that's when I started hiring coaches and hiring mentors and really investing big time in myself and started creating these, these transition tools. I call them the five roads to victory, but these transition tools that help people and myself, they help me specifically, but they also help other people as well. And so now I like to help people navigate their life and their business through those tools. You know what? I, I totally agree with you. The biggest shortcut I've ever taken in shortcuts, because I still continue to do so, yep. is hiring a coach. Yep. Because uh, there's nothing like learning from somebody who's already been there, done that, have t-shirt, right? Yep. It's like, uh, it, it can just shortcut your life years and years. Yep. Um, I think my first coach was in 1999. And I, I've always had one ever since, once once I realized the value. Same here. Um, yeah. <laughs> Same here. Uh, one of the things I read on your bio sheet was, what does it mean to put aces in their places? And that totally piqued my curiosity. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So you hear people talk about hiring a players, right? Creating like okay. real culture that they want to have. And so uh, my coach and I call this talking, we would call this uh, taking aces and putting them in their places, right? It's not just about having quality people. It's about making sure that those people have an outcome that's in alignment with yours, right? As the visionary, as the leader, uh, you can attract great people, but if they want something different than you, like if they're just doing it for the money or they want a different outcome, it's not going to work. But when we find a people and we create opportunity for them, that is, is more than they've ever had. And we create the, the outcome that they're looking for and help them along their way and their journey. It's not just about me, right? It's about the team succeeding as, as a whole. And so mm -hmm. those are aces, right? When those people plug in and they, and they take you to another level, uh, it doesn't, it's not, Joe, the boss and everyone that works for him and his employees, it's the team as a whole. And when you yeah. create that opportunity, it's, it's, it's launch time. Yes, I, I totally agree with that too, because uh, those are the, besides hiring a coach, the next level, like you just said, is getting the right team in place. And in real estate, a lot of those team members, uh, you don't even have to pay them, you know, until they get paid by pulling, bringing the deals together, mortgaging your properties, different stuff like that. But then as you grow from there, it's the staff members and, and other team members that you add to, to help you grow from there. Um, why is it paramount to develop a winning culture in your business? Well, I mean, you just nailed that. You just nailed it on the head though, right? It's, it's, you just said, yeah, right, I can bring on realtors for commission. I think that's a great mentality and it works, but it also works in every facet as long as your outcomes are aligned, right? We have 85% of our legacy developers team is performance-based compensation, right? When we do deals that we all get paid, right? When we can't do deals, we all suffer together. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> It creates this opportunity where, I mean, literally we have, we have attorneys on staff, we have uh, acquisitions reps, we have project managers, almost none of these people have a salary. They're all in it because they know that together we're going to win and they can make way more money than to take a base salary and say, this is it, right? So I want to create that opportunity for people where my vision starts to come true because everyone's in alignment with it coming true. And I think that's one of the big game changers for culture. We're all on the same team. We're all here to win. And their visions can come true too. They just, in some cases, they have to be taught how to set that vision and, and have it coincide with your vision, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, really the first key to, to success or the first road to victory we talk about is limiting beliefs, right? So many folks, you know, they think that they're not smart enough. They think they're not fast enough. They think they're not educated enough. They think they don't have the tools that they need to succeed. And really what's happening is like, we're telling ourselves rational lies, right? We try to rationalize things. I can't do it. Well, why can't you do it? Because I've never done it before. I haven't tried it before. But if you break that rationalized word down to the two, we're actually telling ourselves rational lies about why we're not capable, why we're not talented enough, why we're not educated enough. And the reality of it is I'm a C student and I run eight, seven to eight figure businesses. Like you don't have to have all that stuff. You just have that the mindset, right? So when I start working with folks, I want to make sure I'm looking into their psychotic, their psychology, their beliefs, their values, their, their standards. What, how are they playing? Right. What do they think is possible and kind of play around with that so that they can also see the outcome that they seek. 
Yeah, absolutely. Hey, have you ever read the book, uh, Why Do A Students Work for C Students and C or B Students Work for the Government, Robert? Can you like it? No, but I, I wish I, I would have wrote that one. That's pretty <laughs> You know what? I, That's my favorite book in the whole world. <laughs> that's Joe, funny. That you're a C student. I absolutely yeah. was a C student. And you know, yeah. all through school, we're taught that being C students not good enough, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, you're just average. You're just average. But what I realized after reading that book is that averageness allows us, because we're not stuck in being perfect, being a great student, listening to what everybody else tells us what's to do. So that averageness in school allows us to excel outside of it as long as we learn our strengths. And, and the, yeah, so like you just said, you've got lawyers on your team, all these different yeah. people. Those yeah. are probably all A students. So if by association, we get the value of it, but we didn't have to deal with all the shit they went through, like getting 90s and <laughs> all the stuff that really in real world doesn't even matter, right? Yeah, but and if for, for, you know, you're you're actually, believe it or not, you're very rare, right? Because you actually had that mindset shift and said, this is what I'm going to do. And this is my outcome. I'm going to create it. Uh, and Tony Robbins has this amazing quote. He says, the strongest force in the human personality is the need to be consistent with how we define ourselves, right? You know, creating that unlocking, like redefining who I want to be. You know, you don't have to be the person that you're not happy with, right? You're in a, you're in a world, you're in a space, you're having a lifestyle, you have relationships, you have all these different freedoms that you can create. But what's keeping people from getting there is they have to be consistent with who they are, right? Like I grew up this way. My friends and family are this, this is what they do. Nobody else has ever tried it before. And so we lock ourselves in this mindset and it's actually the, the toughest thing to break. Yeah, yeah, it is. And the increasing awareness, you, you got to study that to become the best you. But I think mm -hmm. the first step is freeing yourself and saying, yeah, there, there's strengths in being a C student. Um, and they don't teach you that in school. And you know, how many people around us, Joe, do we look back and we or run into, and we realize they friggin peaked in high school. Like how sad <laughs> oh, yeah. is that? That's so oh, yeah. sad. <laughs> I just, yeah. you know, I look back and I think, you know, I used to look up to you because you had like a 98 average and, and I've ran into people like this and now government job. And I, I, I remember running into this one specific woman who I went to school with. She had a 98 average in high school. Like everybody looked up to her, like how, God, how can you be so smart? She had yeah. a government job working in a, a bar in the evening to earn extra money because she had a bunch of kids. And I thought, look at what you did to yourself. You know, you believed, first of all, all that hype about getting 98 is like, ah, the be all and end all. I'm going to be like sure. so successful and, and just stop there. Right. Yeah. Now it's me and my business partner laugh about this all the time because we graduated in a very, very small high school. I think our graduating class was like 125 people. Oh, okay. And you know, we laugh because we, we say to ourselves, like, could anybody have ever imagined that we'd be at this level by this age when all of the, you know, valedictorians, I mean, don't get me wrong, not all of them, there's some, no. there's some successful people, but nobody would have thought that we'd be in the top 1% of that class. Yeah, isn't that so true? And it's kind of exciting yeah. to, to see that. And also, because now we can see, I think easier, we can see how we can help other people who are maybe C students, didn't do that well in school, maybe even not doing that well now, that if we can change their vision, they can be on the same path, right? 100%. Yeah. I mean, I mean, a lot of my people are C students too, I think, but, you know, they're excellent negotiators. They're excellent people, people, you know, they, they'd like to have conversations. They like to talk and interact. And, you know, when, I think as long as you're asking really good questions, you're going to start to get the results that you seek. Yeah. And get around the right like-minded people too, right? Absolutely. What's the best investment you've ever made in your business and why? Coaches, mentors, and masterminds, hands okay. down. Yeah. Everything that I do to invest in my own brain is the best investment that I can make. Because again, I, I'm, I'm saying that mindset's important for people to make a change, but I'm living, I'm, I'm living it, right? I have to protect my mindset. I have to make sure that I'm, that I'm telling myself the right thing and feeding myself the right energy um, to get the results that I'm looking for, right? And so, um, you know, nothing that I teach or preach is stuff that I, you know, that I don't do personally. And so um, mindset's the number one thing. And the better you can keep that thing functioning, you know, the more opportunity you're going to create for yourself. Yeah. You even just start to see opportunity that you couldn't see before. Absolutely. What are some tips to help the audience uh, become more fearless? 
Well, number one, I mean, number two is my was mindset. Number one is mindset. Number two is they need a plan of attack, right? Because you know, uh, unfortunately, Edna, so many folks like they plan their trip to Mexico, <laughs> and you know, they can tell you what plane I'm on, where seat I'm in, what the transportation looks like, what hotel I'm staying at, whether I have a pool view or an ocean view, where I'm eating dinner, what kind of drinks I'm gonna have, right? Yeah. They can tell you all those things, but when when you ask them, what do you want to do with your life, right? Where do you want to go this year? You know, what kind of, what kind of things do you want to achieve or hope to achieve their dreams, right? It's gray. You know, you get yeah. these gray answers. Well, I'd like to do this, or I'd like to retire, or I'd like to go travel somewhere, but it's never dialed in and it's never in, um, you know, it's never in a format, which is focused on the outcome. You keep hearing me say this word outcome for a purpose. Um, outcome is, is how we drive goals, right? Where a lot of people are task focused on their goals, right? What things do I have to accomplish? And then they end up staying busy all day instead of staying productive. So we want to figure out a strategy that's going to help you stay productive and stay in the zone and do what we call needle moving activities, things that are going to get you where you need to go. So what are some of those needle uh, moving activities? Uh, whatever it is for that, that person, right? So for me, needle moving activities are spending time coaching my executives, making them better leaders, helping them create opportunity. It could be different for everybody, right? If you want to be the world's best cake baker, then I'm sure you got to put in the reps, right? You got to bake a lot of cakes. You got to mix a lot of icing. You got to, right? So whatever it is for that person um, to create. But what happens is, uh, Edna, we keep uh, a lot of us don't do the tough stuff, right? We don't do the hard work. We don't do the investing work. We try to skate around it by doing the quote unquote busy work. Mm -hmm. And I have this saying, a lot of entrepreneurs who are you know, always putting out fires, you hear these people, oh, I put out so many fires today. They're secretly behind the building, lighting the fire, yes. right? They're, they're creating these <laughs> fires for themselves it. so they can feel busy and they can feel accomplished. But at the end of the day, did they really do anything that was worth productivity that really got them closer to their goal? Mm -hmm. And the answer more often than not is no. And that's unfortunate. Who are some of your favorite uh, mentors and coaches you've had over the years? Um, I have a great coach. His name is Trevor McGregor. He's a, a master, um, master Tony Robbins, platinum level, whatever coach. Uh, okay. He would probably, he'd probably laugh at me for botching that, but I mean, he's been a coach <laughs> for I think 15 years now. He's absolutely incredible. Uh, I have lots of mentors. I have lots of uh, folks that I've been in masterminds with in the real estate world and, um, and, and other, other worlds, you know, just business and stuff like that. So um, there's a lot of great people that, that I owe my success to, and I'm, I'm still in communication with them all the time. Yeah, me too. I love sharing my mentors with my audience because, uh, you know, I've had such huge growth following them over the years yeah. and, and I would not have got where I was today. What, what kind of masterminds do you join? Do you, do you join? Cause this is something, uh, I hear frequently from my students is, you know, got to be in a, a real estate mastermind, but that's not always the case. Do you find that? It was the case for me. I started out, um, there's a guy named Mark Evans DM. He's an amazing mentor of mine. He's been around me for seven, eight years, maybe more. Um, I've been in his group ever since the beginning. I was the first member and, uh, you know, it's a high level. I mean, they charge, I think he charges 35,000 a year now. Okay. Um, you know, and it's, it's about being in that tribe of people that, and again, this is not because I'm real estate. You guys could, you know, your listeners could join any type of mastermind, but, um, I want smaller groups that are higher paid that are going to, it's just a better quality room, you know? So if you want to create your tribe, yeah, you have to invest into getting around the right people because it's not the money you're spending. It's the mindset shift that you have when you're in that room. It's how you act when you're in that room. It's the, the questions you ask when you're in that room change varying on how much, you know, if you went to a free event, right, you wouldn't be asking the same questions you would if it, if it cost you 10 grand to go to that event. Oh, no, I know that sometimes they just feel like other than maybe an introduction. Uh, yeah, they, they get so many people They people get a, an awareness, a, like a little understanding, but they walk out motivated and pumped, but no real steps to make anything happen, right? Yeah, no, I love to work with, you know, I, I've, I've recently, uh, in the last year and a half, I was running masterminds for a long time. I went straight to one-on-one -on -one coaching for that purpose, right? I, I think in groups, uh, great people accelerate because they, they know the right questions to ask and average people have a hard time making something of the group because they don't go out there and ask questions. But in one-on-one -on -one coaching, you can't hide. Right. There's nowhere to hide. It's me and you talking direct to each other each week and really hammering out the issues and the obstacles that are keeping you from getting to the point that you want to get to. Um, so for me, uh, I love one on one coaching. Um, I love masterminds. I think for their they're both valuable for different reasons. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I totally agree. So what's your favorite uh, real estate asset class? Right now, it's self-storage. We are going super heavy in self-storage. Um, I was in the single family fix and flip game for 12 years. We did about a thousand flips in that time. Uh, we did big volume. We did it all over the place. I had a massive team. I had, you know, hundreds of subcontractors. And uh, what we realized was that we we're starting to get burnout. out. We started hitting 80, 90 deals a year that, um, you know, it, we had to find a more scalable asset class that we could use our strengths, which are construction. Um, and my, my, my unique ability is just building amazing teams. I believe that, you know, um, that finding the right people and putting aces in their places, like we said earlier, is the best way to do that. And so we've created probably arguably one of the best teams in the country for finding, um, uh, doing our, our due diligence and entitlements and taking down development deals uh, for self-storage. So when you say development, that means you're building them yourselves? We're building them, yeah. We're either doing um, ground up construction or we're doing uh, big box uh, uh, renovation. So taking you know your, your Sears and your Kmarts of the world and turning them into self-storage. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a few of those empty buildings around, aren't there? <laughs> there are. It's a great opportunity right now. <laughs> and do you, do you have a specific area you're building and buying in, uh, Joe, or, or not? Uh, not necessarily. Right now we have Texas, Ohio, New York, New Jersey. We got a deal in Florida we're doing in a couple of weeks. Uh, I would say everything east of like Texas, you know, the Texas deals are probably as far west as we go right now, but that won't be for long. Okay, perfect. Well, you know what? It was an absolute pleasure having you on uh, the show, Joe. How do people find you? Uh, they're looking for you. They're looking for a coach. They're looking for somebody helping with their real estate. What's the best sure. way to reach out to you? Yeah, we've actually created a, a link. It's called elevatewithjoe.com. Um, and, and that's really the best way people can reach out to me. They can, uh, you know, they can search my stuff. If they want to um, do a coaching call, we could certainly arrange that and set up a introductory discovery call. Um, otherwise, you know, you can just learn more about me on the site and, you know, browse around and ask any questions you might have. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much uh, once again for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Edna. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. It's my sincere intention that you got value from this episode. If you're interested in learning more about building your passive income through real estate, either by investing with us as a joint venture partner or as a student discovering how you can attract investors to your deals and build your own seven-figure real estate portfolio by helping others build their passive income. Check out my website, ednakeep.com, or watch my free masterclass at ednakeep.com slash 90 days to 5k.